Hello, I'm Hushchaw, and welcome to another episode of Let H. My comics have been updating, as usual, every Wednesday, Long Library and the Splash Pages update. The Long Library is currently running great warlock-centered story with hot guys, magic, and fantasy. It's at longlibrary.com. The Splash Pages is running Ball, Book, and Candle with romance, humor, sensuality, and a little kink. That's at thesplashpages.com. There will be links in the description, so check it out, please. If you like what I'm doing, please follow me on social media and consider supporting me on Patreon. Well, this week is the return of American Horror Story, Hotel. Yes, I know, I said I was kind of in need of a break, but uh, this week I sucked it up and watched it, and it was actually a lot better than the previous week's. I think part of this has to do with the fact that it was significantly shorter, like 30 to 40 minutes shorter, and I think that does a better job of what story they have to tell, instead of trying to stretch out an already kind of threadbare amount of story to almost two hours of TV time. This episode starts out with an interesting scene between Damas Model and Evan Peters' character. Evan Peters is a good actor. He knows what he can do, and he does it well. He's interesting, and in this case, he's really creepy, and effectively. We get to see a little bit more development, as anyone who's watched previous American Horror Story series will know, basically, to put it simply, ghosts tend to haunt people and places. There's some restrictions on where they can go and they can't go, but depending on who's writing it this week, characters change, and so does the entire universe, so I wouldn't really worry about it too much. Fashion Moron pops up with the most horrible atelier pronunciation that I've probably ever heard, and we actually see that his friend is Naomi Campbell. So I was right when I was saying someone who was in Absolutely Fabulous and has been wandering around for the last 20 years. No, that's that's just me being silly. Can I just say that the sound quality, in general the sound direction and production, is so much better in this episode that... Naomi Campbell doesn't sound so naff, and her accent actually sounds more like it should. I don't know exactly why she didn't sound right before, but nothing sounded right in the previous two episodes. The sound was horrible. This episode's sound quality is noticeably better. Even the soundtrack is noticeably improved. Like, they've actually made better choices in terms of what sounds they use in the episode. So, bravo! Hats off! The direction is also better, even though it's apparently the same director that directed the previous episode. It's difficult to always find who is responsible 100% sure for every episode. Even if you're looking on IMDb, they don't always have pinpoint accurate things for every episode, and you can't really always rely on them to be accurate for every episode. There is, however, a pretty obvious difference in the writing of this episode and the writing of the previous two episodes. The first episode was god-awful. The second episode was similarly bad, and both of them were drawn out way too long for the amount of story that they didn't have to tell. This one is much shorter, so it's able to keep your interest more effectively. It doesn't overstay its welcome quite so much, even though there are stretches that really, really tax your willingness to keep paying attention to some of these characters. But no, now Gaga's boy toy is working with a ghost, and he is determined to get rid of Fashion Moron and Naomi Campbell, because they are a danger to the hotel. They're going to try and overhaul it and take out rooms and all this stuff. So apparently also the model is a real big fan of Evan Peters' serial killing work, so uh, I guess he's got that going for him. Whatever, I guess. We end up catching up with uh, Camp Gay Detective's wife, And she actually seems more interesting this time, but the acting is still not really very good. It's awkward in the narration. The character has some interesting attributes, and she has some interesting experiences. The fact that she is a tortured person. She feels bad about what happened, and she even attempts suicide at one point. It's interesting, but it's also kind of a cheap tactic to make us sympathize with her when she really isn't very interesting herself, nor is she particularly sympathetic. She's as much of an asshole as her husband is, and she's about as stiff. That's a shame, but at least this episode does a little something to make us kind of care a little bit, rather than the we-just-don't-care previously. 
Max Greenfield's character comes back, but unfortunately he's as wasted here as he was in the previous two episodes. It's a real shame because there's a lot of potential there, and he's not a bad actor. It's just that he's given nothing to do but do that stupid gasping, spasming thing that he does. And that's just not interesting. It looks stupid. And it keeps looking dumber every time he does it. Cam Gay Detective continues his investigations. We don't care. We don't care about this stupid commandment killer. It's not interesting. It's just dumb. It continues to be dumb in this episode. And Cam Gay Detective is such a flat character, and so unlikable, fundamentally, that it's difficult to really care about anything he does. The proceedings are not anything we haven't seen before, and the things going on at the hotel are way more interesting. Boy Toy tries to seduce Fashion Moron and then is intent on killing him, and Gaga shows up and says no. Silently, of course. At least I'm not motivated to turn off the show every time I see Gaga now, which may be a result of the improved direction and script writing. I don't know why there was such a difference between episode 2 and 3, since supposedly they have the same director, but maybe this episode he just wasn't phoning it in. Or maybe because the previous episode was so long he wasn't able to maintain the quality for quite as long. There is some really interesting direction in this episode, and he actually gets good performances out of people that I know have them, like Kathy Bates, who has been sleepwalking through the previous two episodes. Hypodermic Sally also has a weirdly prolonged seduction sequence. It's interesting, though, and we find out a little bit more about her personality and character, even though we don't find out ultimately all that much. And, of course, Camp Gay Detective is there, which is dull. But at least we're transitioning to something more interesting. Donovan talks to his mother, and they have an extremely awkward conversation. But, as in most American Horror Story episodes, this week's episode... The characters are fairly different than they were in the previous episode. This week, Kathy Bates' character Iris is sympathetic. Who knew? She plays the character exceptionally well this week, though, and she does a good job of conveying a tortured character written with a sense of humor. The leitmotif this week appears to be tortured mothers and weird things that they do. It's also, unfortunately... Mothers that don't quite manage to be sympathetic because we still don't know that much about either of the characters except that they are more assholes than they've given us anything sympathetic to work with. It's okay, though, because overall the characters keep the story going. And that's what you really want to do in a show like this because you don't want the audience to stop and think about what you're not telling them. The big problem with the previous two episodes was that there were too many stretches where not much of anything was happening, so your mind got to settle in and think about some of the things that it wasn't saying, or that it wasn't doing a very good job of presenting. After Gaga attempts to seduce the gay fashion idiot, we get another god-blasted flashback. You know, they could have just done this show from the 70s to today if they were going to do so many flashbacks in every episode. Why do we need so many flashbacks? At least a quarter of every episode is spent in flashback. In any case, this flashback was at least not quite so painful as some of the other ones, but it was pretty embarrassing because it attempted to tie into real people and events that really didn't make a lot of sense to be tied into. Why did it have to be that? It makes it less believable and less interesting overall, because you look at it and you think, eh, no, I'm not willing to buy that this was tied in somehow, that's just silly. And ultimately you don't want this kind of story to strike you as silly. That's exactly what it does, so I really wish they would stop trying to tie it into real people and events, or even try to imitate Real people in events, like the hilariously bad disco flashback, where they were trying to do something based on a real-world event, and then just keep building on it, keep making it go over the top. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work at all. The show gives off a weird rapey vibe, and it's like vampire steamroll mind rape. First of all, aggressive sexual advances against someone's sexual orientation is a very, very messy area of consent. And what Gaga is doing in this episode is tantamount to rape. Even in the later flashback from uh, Angela Bassett's character, because of what Gaga did earlier, 
that casts really rapey feelings on it, and I don't think that's really a good thing. I don't think they presented it in a way where it really adds much of anything to the story, and it only makes these characters creepier, which doesn't really make you want to see more of what they're doing. I don't really like the whole rape motif that seems to be recurring in this story. It seems to be used more sensationalistically, rather than actually contributing anything, and I don't think that that is a good way to use it. In the first series, Murder House, there was a technical rape where someone had sex with someone else, but wasn't actually certain of who their partner was, as they thought they were. It's still rape, because they did not consent to have sex with this person. However, it actually had something to do with the plot and contributed to the development of the story. Most of the stuff in this series doesn't actually do that, which I think is a real indicator of how unnecessary it really is. Second, I'm just going to point out something. If you were a vampire, an attractive woman, would your first impulse be to try and attract a rich person who was interested in you? or try and attract a rich person who was not interested in you. Especially if you have weird mind rapey powers that allow you to seduce just about anyone. Wouldn't it be easier if you didn't have to use those quite so much? Wouldn't it be easier if you had someone to seduce that would otherwise be interested in you anyway? If you're Lady Gaga, I know you have a lot of gay fans and everything, but as she is not actually playing Lady Gaga in this, as much as I've said that she's basically just playing fanfiction Lady Gaga as a vampire, I don't think she's going to be barking up the right tree to try and seduce a gay dude. It's just kind of dumb. There's no end of well-off dudes that she could seduce, trick into marrying her, and then kill off to get their money, but trying to seduce a dude that is known to be gay is not going to be a great triumph for her, especially if someone who knows him and is close to him points out, hey, you married him under false pretenses, or maybe this bitch is after your money. This kind of goes hand in hand with him refusing to keep their murder hotel a secret. This is really the extent of your strategy and planning? You've had hundreds of years to come up with this shit. But speaking of things that gay audiences don't want to see, we go and find Camp Gay Detective meeting his wife in the bar. It's awkward. It's obnoxious. It's stupid. It gets even dumber when they go back to the room after Camp Gay Detective pulls a maybe I'm crazy thing, which only comes off as him basically pulling a stunt to try and trick his wife into pitying him and not filing divorce on him. He also gets really, really skeevy when they start to make out after she gives him some sleeping pills and puts him in bed, fully clothed, because, you know, people rest and relax comfortably when they're wearing three layers of clothing. And he says, let's have another baby. Yeah, it was that stupid and awkward. Because, you know, we really know the audience that we have for this show. I'm gonna just say this. Most of the audience for American Horror Story will probably be either gay or interested in gay characters. Why is it that the writers apparently think their audience wants to see straight couple baby daddy problems more than anything else? This dude is not sympathetic. He's very camp, but he's also an idiot. And though I call him Camp Gay Detective, I only do that because he's so forgettable I don't remember his name or the name of any of his family. I don't think he's supposed to really be a gay character, even if his actor plays him up slightly broader than Truman Capote. Having a show revolve around a fairly dull family and their drama may have been forgivable in the first series because at that point they really didn't know the kind of audience they were going to get. However, at this point, they know the audience that they're shooting for. They obviously are trying for a specific audience, and they're getting it. We don't need to see straight couple baby daddy problems. Even with the time we've spent with Cam Gay Detective and his wife in this episode, we're not interested anymore in their unfolding drama. We don't care. Get to the really interesting parts, or at least what passes for them in this show. 
The wife does get haunted, and it's kind of a funny sequence, but we don't know what else is happening, because she's obviously seen her lost child in the hotel. Kathy Bates' character Iris has an interesting development of her character after a confrontation with Donovan, who is kind of putting on more clothes than he usually does this week. She wants to die, so she gets together with Sally and they start to have a moment, which is amusing because it's interesting for the characters, and it's very well acted, actually. It's written with a sense of humor, which is very good, because such a sequence can quickly become relentless and trying, or it can become cloying and trying too hard. This actually works very well for both of the characters involved, and it makes us actually care about both of the characters involved even if we haven't really done that up to this point. So regardless if they're pulling a couple of stunts on us to try and get us here, it still is something that is welcome, and it's done a lot better than the previous two attempts. We also meet Angela Bassett's Ramona Real character and her hideous coat. Fortunately, she sheds the coat after the first scene she's in. Most of the flashback is kind of fun, and there was some really good direction here too, with her relationship with Gaga, especially the sequence where they're in the lift and the decades go by, and it shows them growing apart and also wearing fashions typical of that period of time. I thought that was interesting. I thought that was well done. That was a turn that was something I could point to and say, yes, that is something good that American Horror Story is doing. They should have done more stuff like this. It shows me that there is the possibility for excellence in this, it's just unfortunate that they so rarely get there. The fun flashback does become stupid, though, because apparently Ramona finds a man, and she decides to turn him into a vampire, and Gaga gets jealous even though she's totally distant by this point and doesn't seem to give two shits about Ramona except to control her. So Gaga kills all of these people, and we're supposed to be upset that Ramona has gone through this shitty time, and we are sympathetic to her. But how the fuck did Gaga cover up all those deaths? Again, refusing to keep the murder hotel a secret. She's not good at stealth. She's not good at keeping stuff secret. She's very, very bad at it. Everybody is. There's no freaking way that she kept this massive massacre a secret, or covered it up effectively. I just don't buy it. Donovan returns to the hotel and has a surprisingly inane exchange with Liz Taylor at the bar, who tells him that, for some reason, no one will ever love him as much as his mother, despite the fact that we really weren't clear on that. Even though the character was more sympathetic in a previous scene, it didn't really make us buy that she really cared for him. She just doled out a bunch of stock excuses like, Oh, I gave you life! I saved your life. I saved your life. Oh, wait. Tysa Famiga isn't in this series. It was a pretty stupid ending, unfortunately. And it doesn't really make me hopeful for next week, but the rest of the stuff I've seen makes me a bit more hopeful for the next episode. They've shown that they can do good stuff. It's just that, unfortunately, most of the time they don't. However, I'm going to give the next episode a try because this episode was so much better than the first two episodes. Maybe it just needs the shorter format to maintain a higher level of excellence. So what are your thoughts? Comment below, let me know what you think. I'd love to talk with you about it. I always try and respond to all of my comments. I always like to engage you in a conversation, so please let me know. Check out my links below. Follow me on social media if you can. Support me on Patreon. I'd love to have your help so that I can make more of these and do better at them, make them fancier, make them more fun, and provide you with more entertainment. It was great to spend this time with you. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be notified whenever I upload the next episode of Let's H, or any videos. See you next time. Bye.